All right. Um, once again, welcome everyone to the Flatiron School Final Project Showcase. My name is Michelle Pathé. I'm a community manager here, and I'm super excited to be with some of our recently uh, graduated software engineering and data science students. Um, tonight, each of these folks are going to walk us through um, their final project presentations that they built. Um, we will have time after each presentation for questions. So if you do want to ask a particular presenter a question about the app that they built or their project that they're presenting, go ahead and use the Q&A button. Um, that is in the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. I will be keeping an eye on that Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to everyone's uh, questions. Uh, again, keep using the chat. I would love to see people uh, showing support and, and just maybe even making some comments about, about the, uh, the project tonight. Let's let's kind of keep that engaged, and I'll I'll keep an eye on the chat uh, throughout the night as well. So with that, we are going to kick things off with our first presenter. I've got Casey Ramirez here with us. Uh, Casey is a software engineering graduate, and will be presenting his project Rambler. Casey, go ahead and take it away. All righty, how's it going, everyone? Um... Can y'all see my screen? Looks good. All right, cool. Well, uh, Michelle, funny you asked that because um, I just watched Forrest Gump, fantastic movie. And I just went through the process on this app of creating a profile for a fake user named Forrest Gump. And so let's imagine we did that together. We're obviously going to skip that just for time's sake. Um, but yeah, here's Rambler. I uh, came up with the idea. Um, one day I had to present my final capstone project and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I did what every good software engineer does. I blew it off and went on a walk. Um, and like many software engineers, I love going on walks. It really helps me think about things and uh, really look at different codes and algorithms from a just from a different angle. And so I thought it'd be great if there was an app that could connect you with other software engineers or just other people in the tech industry um, in your area uh, to do things like go on a walk or hike or bike. And so that's kind of how the app was born. Um, so yeah, let's imagine we walked through that sign up process together. And here we are at our homepage um, around me. And you'll notice whenever you first create an account, uh, Rambler is kind of notifying you. You've got this little notification here in the account page. And so if we navigate on over to our account page, you see uh, Rambler's actually asking you for more information. And the reason why uh, Rambler was designed this way is because I didn't want to ask the users too much information up front. Um, I thought that might defer users and not be a super friendly experience. And so I wanted to ask only the essential stuff and kind of the added things like profile pictures and, and cover photos. Um, we could ask, you know, we could kind of complete that later. And so let's go ahead and finish this profile. Um, so let's go on over here. We'll give uh, Forrest Gump a great profile photo and we can even give him a home, uh, a cover photo just to kind of really make it feel uh, personal and make Rambler feel a little bit more like home. And let's say, you know, Forrest Gump, he's really been, you know, he's really been on his code and grind. And so he actually just got promoted at uh, Flatiron School to be a senior software engineer. And so we can go ahead and update his uh, profile and um, we just have to put in the password um, to authenticate that it is us. Um, and you'll see that those changes not only persist on the front end, but um, on the back end as well, of course. So if we uh, refresh the page, those, those changes are still there. And um, we can actually set a goal with Rambler. Um, Rambler helps us track how active we've been um, to help us achieve our goals. And so let's go ahead and set a goal of 20 miles. Um, if we set that, you see that that's updating in real time. And so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and start signing up for some walks, right? So we can we can uh, get closer to that goal. You'll see our other user stats are are empty. Um, so here's around me, uh, and these are just different walks going on in our area. Um, and we can also create our own walks um, in the Go page. 
Um, so let's go ahead and uh, sign up for uh, this walk with a guy named Casey Jones uh, Friday, tomorrow at 7 a.m. Um, if we hike with him, we'll see that our walk has been scheduled and we will go ahead and sign up for uh, this walk as well. Um, a guy named Don Henley. And so if we go over to our activities page, which is kind of our homepage, we'll see that these activities actually show up in our calendar. Um, we can click on it and we can message these users. Hello. And they come up. Um, and let's go to the around me. Um, and if you remember, we already signed up for a walk tomorrow at 5 a.m. at 5 p.m. So if we try to sign up for another one, uh, we're actually not allowed to do that because Rambler checks our schedule to ensure that, um, yeah, just to ensure that we're not double booking because that wouldn't really make sense, right? And so here we are uh, in another account. Um, you'll see if we refresh the page, we're, we're here in Don Henley, uh, who's, who's the user that we signed up with to go on a walk. Um, you'll see Don Henley's actually notified that we've been signed up to go on a run with Forrest. Um, we can see that show up here in his account. Um, and so here's, uh, here's that activity with Forrest. Um, and so, yeah, that is basically Rambler. Um, it was created, uh, the front end was created with React, back end was with Rails. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm super proud of how it turned out. And so, yeah, that's Rambler. Awesome. Well done, Casey. Well done. You're getting some love over there in the chat. Um, folks, reminder to drop any questions. Uh, if you have any in that Q and A box in the chat, um, nothing, nothing there yet for you, Casey. But I would love to know, um, you know, as as you're kind of as you wrapped up your time here, uh, and you're kind of working on working on cleaning up projects or maybe even adding to your current projects. Would love to know if you have any ideas for future iterations of Rambler. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, something I'm super interested in is taking Rambler Mobile. I would love to uh, kind of code a you know a mobile version of the app, um, probably in React Native. Um, but that's kind of the the most exciting thing, the most pressing idea right now. Nothing too crazy outside of that. Cool, awesome. Um, someone did ask in the, the Q and A, will you show your last slide? Is that your contact info? Uh, last the, slide. Um, the last, yeah. uh, whatever the last thing you showed was. Yeah. Pop yeah. it up real quick. Um, yeah, I, th I think it was the activity page. Cool. I could be wrong, but yeah, there, there it is. Um, awesome. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Casey. That was, uh, that was awesome. Great way to yeah, kick this off. Yeah. Thank you guys. All right. Um, moving on our next presenter, we've got Chris Holman, uh, a data science graduate presenting global climate analysis. Chris, take it away. All right. So as Michelle said, my name is Chris Holman. I'm a data scientist living in Washington state currently. Uh, my first career is actually in healthcare in physical therapy, but I started to see all the cool things and cool projects that data science was being used for and I wanted to be a part of it. So I quit my job and started bartending and here I am. But uh, ultimately the idea was to be involved with things that I'm passionate about. And one of those is sustainability, which is also part of the reason why I did my capstone project on our global climate. The goal of the project as a whole was to take a look at historical temperature and identify trends and create a long-term forecast. Uh, I then developed a secondary model to look at contributors to climate change and to develop interventions based on that insight. It's really developed, it's really divided rather into two separate projects. So the first one was a time series decomposition, which is kind of a cool 
technique used when one data point is highly dependent on the value that preceded it. So it can be used for things like weather or the stock market. Um, and for that one, I was able to find historical temperature points for global averages um, from 1750 to 2015. 1850 is really when people started sharing measurements with one another and the data became a lot more accurate then. So I started around 1850 for my, my time series model. Uh, secondarily is looking at regression. So how two variables are related to one another. Uh, so I looked at forest area, oil consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, population and GDP as they relate to temperature as well. For the final model for my time series, I ended up using an algorithm called uh, Neural Profit. So this is a look at the last two years. So I held out 2014 and 2015 and used the model to try to predict those monthly temperatures. And I was able to predict 24 months worth of data with a 0.45 mean absolute error. So basically within just under half a degree per on average off. Um, since it was performing so well, I ended up using this one as the final forecast. But really more interesting than the metrics are the components of the model itself. So this is a direct output from the model. Um, as you can see, there's a significant uptrend starting in the early 1970s. And that's the top chart. And in the middle chart, you can see the trend segments. So if you saw a positive bar and then flat, it would mean that it's increasing at a constant rate. Those The series of positive bars means that it's continuing to increase uh, up until like the cutoff point for, for change points. Uh, this chart gets a little messy because there's so many points on it, but in general, you're looking at the highs, the lows, and therefore the averages are all projected to increase at a relatively constant rate. And in total, uh, my model projects that the global temperature average will increase by another 1.5 degrees by 2045, which is in line with a number of different studies, including the U.S. Global Change Research Project, which predicts a change of two to three degrees by 2060, depending on a number of different emission scenarios. Uh, secondly, we're looking at the regression model now. So these are correlations between uh, population, forest cover, oil consumption, emissions, and temperature. As you can see, there are strong po positive correlations uh, with everything except for forest cover, uh, which decreases. So as one tends to increase, the other decreases for forest cover and the other way around for the other variables. So when using these to try to predict the temperature of a given year, um, we're, we ended up able to do that within, again, about 0.43 degrees Fahrenheit. Without getting too deep into the specifics of the model, this metric is essentially just how useful uh, a given variable was for predicting temperature. So the strongest predictors were population, oil consumption, and emissions. As a whole, uh, the big takeaways are a strong upward trend beginning in the 70s, which is accelerating and projected to be at least 1.5 degrees higher by 2045 as well as the strong correlations between the variables that we used in the regression model. Interesting takeaway there is that uh, GDP was almost, had almost no correlation with anything. Uh, so while well, the EPA estimates that 24% of total emissions are caused by industrial consumption, that doesn't necessarily correlate with any sort of increase in, in the GDP. And lastly, looking in particular at population and emissions uh, for as predictors of, of temperature change. So my next steps would be to look specifically at emissions for, for smaller areas. In other words, where is it coming from? Does it increase or decrease seasonally? And in the event of a sudden massive increase in, in emissions, such as the industrial revolution or the popularity of passenger vehicles, how long does it take for those events to have a measurable impact on our climate? Uh, secondly, is population. So the world population is currently around 8 billion and is projected to be as high as 10 billion by 2060. And barring us moving people to a different planet or Thanos 
from the Avengers having a little bit more success, that's not changing. So it's imperative that we try to minimize the effect that this growing population has on our climate. With that in mind, I'd like to look country by country or even city by city to see what, who's growing, who's consuming the most, and look for examples of either successful countries uh, so that we can use them as a template for climate related um, policy. And conversely, looking at places that are doing poorly and where the impact of more sustainable energy, for example, might have a, a greater effect. And then lastly, just looking at seasonal weather. So in addition to the general trend of warming, we've seen higher highs and lower lows and wider temperature swings. So I'd like to look at smaller areas to see who is most affected by this and try to quantify the economic and social impact of these extreme weather events um, with the idea of, of just spreading awareness and trying to do as much as I can to, to help the trend of global warming. Um, this has been a really fun project for me to work on, and uh, I'm I'm passionate about it. So if you'd like to ask any questions or you want to reach out to me, uh, those are my contact informations. And uh, thanks for listening. Awesome, nice job, Chris. Thank you. Um, I am curious to know. You know, obviously you had several weeks to kind of work work on this project. Um, were there any findings or did anything come up in the process of creating this that you really weren't expecting um and how did you kind of navigate any of those unexpected um happenings yeah i i thought the data would be more readily available um, and easy to format um, so really the biggest struggle and this one was just getting everything into a format where I could feed it into an algorithm. Um, and so really messing a lot with different data sets and trying to get them all looking the same so that you could create one cohesive model out of all of them was, was really the biggest issue. Awesome. Um, Ryan's got a question for you. Uh, Ryan says what happened in 1850 that caused greater sharing of temperature info uh, the invention of the telegraph uh, so it was right before that but around 1851 i believe is when the first centralized weather uh, i guess you call it like a center was invented and they started keeping more accurate records of temperatures throughout the globe awesome um he also wants to know, can your backtesting methods be used for something like a trading algorithm slash bot in financial markets? Yeah, no, it's uh, used really kind of time series decomposition is most widely used in the stock market. That's really where it's most prevalent. Cool. Um, awesome. Chris, awesome work. Uh, go ahead, drop, drop your contact info in the chat. You're also getting lots of love over there so be sure you check that out as well oh, thank um, you yeah for sure all right i am excited to introduce our next presenter we've got john mccaffrey coming up who is also a data science graduate um, and john will be presenting his project fall detection model for older adults john take it away cool thanks very much um I'm going to blow your mind by saying I was also a physical therapist before this too. So now I'm a data scientist, but I was a physical therapist for 15 years in a variety of settings. Tonight I'll talk about a fall detection model with older adults in mind. And my proposed stakeholder is Allison Olschleger, Medicare's chief data officer. To give you an overview, um, I'll talk about the challenge related to falls in older adults and the importance of a real-time fall detection model. Talk about the data I used for this as well as my methods and modeling process, I'll give you a summary at the end. So first off, falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in older adults. John, let me interrupt you adults. real quick. Can we see, uh, yeah. I think we got to see those slides. Oh, my bad. All good, all good. Sorry, I thought it was going next. No, oh, you're good. Yeah. Cool. 
Beautiful. In there? Yep. Yeah. All right. So, falls are the leading cause of fatal and non fatal injuries in older adults. An older adult here is age 65 or older. The cost in 2015 of non fatal injuries alone is $50 billion. It's also a huge social and emotional impact for an older adult who sustained a fall. They tend to restrict their activities and become more socially isolated. So as the PT, I started to wonder what role data science could play in being able to detect a fall, maybe give a real-time alert and hopefully reduce the severity of the injury and the potential cost, and maybe allow an older adult to be able to stay in their home a little bit longer, living independently. This is an illustration from the CDC on the projected increase of total older adults in our population uh, by the year 2030, as well as the increase in falls and injuries related to falls. Uh, the data I used came from the ARCO Research Group in Spain. It's publicly available. They had 17 subjects go through 45 total tasks each, including activities of daily living, like walking up and down the stairs or standing up and sitting down, as well as some simulated fall tasks. All the data was collected by one sensor worn at waist level. It's able to detect acceleration and rotation and the absolute orientation of the subject. Um, absolute orientation is defined in terms of roll, pitch, and yaw, which I'll refer to later on as well. And ARCO actually used this research to create a smart mirror in the home. And I'll show you a picture of that at the end, too. So for my methods and modeling, methods first, the data set contained both raw data, so like second-to-second -second real time data, as well as more aggregated data that would be taking the raw data and calculating the means and variance and standard deviation. I mostly use the raw data in the modeling, again, for that real-time model. ARCO also had its own separate test data set, which I'll use at the very end. And this is a binary classification test. So the goal is to look at all the activities and classify whether it was or was not a fall. The metrics I used for each model were primarily accuracy and recall. A high recall would mean that there's very few false negatives. And a false negative would mean that the model said the fall had not occurred when actually had occurred. So I was really trying to get to zero false negatives. I wanted to be able to catch every single fall accurately. And since this is a real-time model, I also took into account the prediction time of each model. So through this process, first I started off with some unsupervised exploratory analysis using principal component analysis and k-means clustering. It really didn't illustrate any inherent groupings in the data, unfortunately. Then I did what's called a train test split that allows me to reserve my own little portion of test data. I ran a baseline model, it's called a dummy classifier, and that was 59% accurate. Then on to logistic regression models that up the accuracy with tuning to 92%, but still with hundreds of false negatives. Then I tried what's called a k-nearest neighbors model, and with grid searching, got a high accuracy, high recall, zero false negatives, but unfortunately a long prediction time. And I moved on to tree-based models, a much faster prediction time, and with grid searching, also high accuracy and recall, but not quite as good as the k nearest neighbors. And lastly, I moved on to what's called ensemble methods. Again, trying to find the model with the highest accuracy, highest recall, zero false negatives, and a fast prediction time. So the winner there is called extreme gradient boosting. The XG boost model had the highest accuracy here. This is looking at the cross-validation scores on the training data, slightly ahead of the k-nearest neighbor from the grid search. XGBoost also had the highest recall scores, just by a tiny bit. Where it really differentiates itself is in the prediction time for each model. So it's able to achieve the highest accuracy and recall with zero false negatives and does it in 200 of a second. So then this is looking at that reserve test data I did earlier. So this is the XGBoost model. I was able to classify every activity correctly, whether it's an ADL or a fall. So zero false negatives and does it in one hundredth of a second. So then I finally opened up the ARCO test data set. I hadn't opened it up yet to avoid any kind of like data leakage. And when I did open it up, it was missing that roll, pitch, and yaw I mentioned earlier. So we'll find out how important that was in a second. But I, uh, I ran the best model I had on the raw data on the ARCO test data set. Unfortunately, it resulted in four false negatives, and that for this data set, that's a 0.0006% error, which sounds fantastic, but this would be four times that the model said no fall had occurred when it actually had an emergency alert was not, you know, was not alerted, so trying to avoid that at all costs. So how important were those features? Turns out there are three of the top five most important features for my model. So the lesson here is any real-time model using the XG boost algorithm would have to include these three features from the sensor. 
as sort of an aside, I was wondering if real time uh, monitoring was not viable or too expensive. Perhaps we could create a system that receives a snapshot of intermittent bundled updates from the sensor and maybe makes aggregated calculations from that. So I took the two best models I had from the raw data, the K nearest neighbors and the XG boost, and then used the aggregated data set. And in this circumstance, the K nearest neighbors actually outperformed XG boost for the accuracy and for the recall, again with fault, zero false negatives. So this is just another model to consider in this sort of time lapse window idea, then the prediction time is really not much of a concern. In conclusion, falls are a major concern for older adults in the United States in terms of injury and cost and quality of life. And as we saw from the CDC, the total number of older adults in the country will continue to increase as will likely falls and injuries related to those falls. So perhaps machine learning could play a role in being able to detect those falls, whether in, through an XG boost model or K nearest neighbors, and hopefully reduce the severity of injuries, the cost and improve quality of life. And then this is a real life application with the ARCO research. Um, they were able to create a smart mirror in the home that has a small computer that's able to pick up the sensor data, process it, and determine whether or not a fall has occurred, and if so, uh, uh, alert emergency personnel. So pretty cool. Uh, thanks very much for listening. There's my contact information. If there's any questions, go for it. Awesome. Nice job, John. And I do want to apologize for uh, uh, having you go in a little bit earlier than you were expecting to present. You took that like a chance. No worries. There's two, there's two Johns. <laughs> there, I, I got my Johns mixed up. I'm so sorry, but you you did a great job. Um, Thank you. That's but, crazy that uh, like with Chris story and then I saw Justin in the chat. And I was like, there's, there's a few PTs out there that are maybe yeah. changing over to the data. Science. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome. Hopefully they uh, they reach out to you and if they have any more questions about, about that transition, I'm sure you could be a great resource. That'd be awesome, um, yeah. We've got, a, we've got a question for you. Um, someone is curious, in your model selection slide, are those all models that you learned in your data science program? Yeah, and that was um, the cool thing about the, the final project is you could totally choose anything in your entire learning experience for you know, as long as you find a subject matter that you're really passionate about like Chris was um, and Casey you know you can choose anything in your arsenal to uh, try and get to the answers to your questions so yeah I kind of went through what seemed like when you're talking about a binary classification test those are those are really good options to consider so that's why I went through them cool um, since maybe we do have some folks, um, watching tonight who are not yet in our program, or maybe they just started recently, um, could you maybe talk through very shortly, like when you do get to that final project phase, um, how does, how does just starting that final project work? You know, you're, you're in the program with a lot of structure for a long time, and then suddenly it's like, okay, let's take everything you learned and you're going to apply it to your project. Could you walk us through like just what those initial steps are to kind of getting this kind of project together? Yeah, so this was, so your capstone project is the fifth phase out of five. Even before you start the fourth phase, you're already asked to just brainstorm over a weekend, like put three ideas down with just one or two sentences to summarize it, just getting your, your mind sort of wrapping around what would you be interested in pursuing? And then later on in phase four, you're asked to sort of flush those ideas out um, in terms of actually finding viable data to use. And that can be um, like an eye-opening experience too. Like I thought of this project, but I also thought of doing something with the Spotify's API and then looking at um, like creating a craft beer recommendation system. Um, so then once I was like looking at the quality of the data out there, I realized that this would probably be the best uh, best thing to work with and also probably the most applicable to my transition from healthcare and then into the data science field. So yeah, the process is like initial brainstorming, then see what you can really create out of those ideas. And then hopefully by the start of this fifth phase, like once you're done all the other phases, you're hitting the ground running with a good data set and a really good idea in mind. Awesome. Thanks for giving a, a little breakdown. Hopefully some 
uh, early data science folks are are excited about that. Okay. I mean, if you want to go into this field, you probably already have questions in your head that you want to solve. <laughs> yeah, John, uh, go ahead and, and drop your contact info in the chat, just in case um, the the physical therapy group in here wants to uh, reach out to you. All right, will do. All right, folks, next up, we're going to have a software engineering presentation from John Hawes, who will be presenting his project, Memory. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Hawes. I am a software engineer uh, based out of Denver. Um, my project uh, started, it was inspired by my beautiful wife, uh, Melody, um, and it was supposed to be like a, a little sort of rating system of all of the Broadway shows that we've been to and how much we've either loved or hated them. And then during the planning stages, I found out that I also wanted to include like the restaurants we've been to, the vacations we've been on, and like everything that we've done. So that's what the the site eventually became. Uh, we'll go ahead and share my screen. So the, why is this not working? Okay. Is this working? Yep, looks good. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so the problems I set out to solve were that uh, life moves too quickly to be both doing exciting things all the time and also remembering all of the exciting things we do. Uh, there's always something that you seem to forget. Uh, but at its core, I kind of wanted to explore the relationships between users uh, and user generated content and maybe in friendships and stuff in a quasi like social media, um, but digital scrapbooking sort of platform. But Let's check it out. So right away, we are taken to the landing page. Uh, I styled this whole thing with uh, Tailwind CSS, um, and I based it off of kind of like a 70s retro, uh, sort of like old book kind of thing. And using Tailwind, is able to replicate a lot of the same themes throughout the website. So you'll see a lot of these same colors and sort of schemes show up. Uh, if we log in as an existing user, there are validations in place, but of course, it's always more fun to create one. There are also validations on the sign-in page, uh, just to show off a little bit, but we'll create one for Tom. And right away, uh, users are directed to their profile page and prompted to create content. Um, existing users will get directed to the main timeline feed, which we'll see in just a second. But I wanted to encourage users to kind of like get in there, get their hands dirty right away. So what we can do is start by creating a profile. There's a little Easter egg kind of built in for if it is your birthday, which we'll see in a little bit. Ready. Nice. So it says happy birthday, which is kind of fun. Um, and then every user is defaulted with an elephant avatar because an elephant never forgets. Uh, but we can upload our own profile picture uh, with active storage. Um, and uh, all of the uh, all of the images right now are being held in local storage. Um, I Fortunately, this is all uh, deployed on render, but uh, setting up the storage with Google and the whole integration there um, crashed my uh, deployment. So I chose one over the other because I wanted my family to be able to see this app as soon as possible, but it's kind of a stretch goal in the future. But if we submit, we see that our profile picture was added. Uh, we also have the ability to edit our profile if we so choose, which is super fun. Um, but after this, we'll go ahead, we'll follow our prompt and create some memories. There's also validations built into these. Uh, the category selection here uh, determines a little color-coded tag that shows up on the memory card uh, when it's created, um, which we'll also see in just a little bit.
And then once the memory is created, we are directed uh, to the memory details page where we have uh, the ability to edit our memory, of course, and delete if we so choose. On this drop down menu, we can see the comments that have been added to the memory, but of course it's brand new, so there aren't any comments but we can go ahead and create our own comment. And it populates there. We have a little delete button here if we want to delete the comment as well. But if we navigate it back to Tom's profile, we'll see that not only has his profile been created like before, but also the memory and the comment he's created. We can navigate back to the memory through the card and we can navigate to the commented memory through a link in the comment. Um, on the main page, we will see a global feed of all of the memories that have been created by all users. And we see that Tom's trip that he has created falls in line chronologically with the rest of our events and trips and stuff. Um, if we Tom wanted to click on a different event, we can see that there are comments here as well, but he cannot delete these comments. He can certainly add his own, but he also can't edit or delete this particular memory. Um, but that is the gist of the website. The tech that I was using for this on the front end, we got our uh, whole app built with React. React Router is uh, controlling our client side routing. Uh, got use context in there to handle some of the state. Uh, Tailwind, like I mentioned, for design, and then an add-on called date functions, uh, which helps render the formatting of dates in React, which was honestly uh, more of a pain than it should have been. Uh, but for the back end, we got set up on Rails. Uh, Postgres is handling our database. Acrypt is handling our authorization. Uh, Active Storage is handling the user avatars. <clears throat> and then there's a handful of just fun... Ruby gems thrown in there to make our lives easier. <clears throat> Challenges that I faced uh, with this app was the big one was sorting the cards, uh, the event cards into a timeline and keeping them chronological uh, because just how I wanted the app set up, that was kind of the, the cornerstone of the whole thing. So I used vanilla CSS for the basic structure of the timeline and then used Tailwind to kind of fill in the details on that little card. Um, active storage was also kind of a bigger headache than I thought it was going to be, but ended up working out okay. Um, and then always knowing when to stop adding features and start polishing and making it ready to present. Uh, future extensions, as you can see, I have a lot of ideas for this app. Um, it was kind of just heartbreaking because it was like, no, I had so many features I wanted to add. But I mean, it, the nature of phase five, I guess, is you're limited by time. But most of the stuff I want to add is uh, just integrating third-party tech, um, building out that the user friendships and making like favorites, um, trying to integrate active mailer to, to mail you know, uh, users once they're created, um, and also adding links to like Airbnb or Yelp or just kind of making the entire website more robust in general. Uh, but I kind of set up the website to have all of that sort of al allowed, you know, it's, it's more of like a sandbox to kind of experiment with just keep building this out more and more. Um, so I'm excited to get my hands dirty there. If you wanted to check out the live deployed website, there's a link there. Uh, the repo on, is on GitHub, of course, my LinkedIn, my email. And if you'd like to, you are more than welcome to check out my blog. But thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Nice work, John. That was fantastic. Loved watching that. Um, I've got a question for you from Ryan. Ryan says, tell us a bit more about Tailwind and why you chose that over other libraries. Also, what was the date tech that you used? Sure. Uh, so I chose Tailwind off of the recommendation of other uh, people in my cohort, um, just because it was sort of really easy to approach. Um, if you are, I already had like that little bit of CSS knowledge through just past projects before getting to this. Um, so it was, it's nice that Tailwind kind of takes some of that CSS and uh, a lot of the sort of nebulous things that it solves all those problems for you. So like it has a color palette 
for every red uh, that's out there, it has a color palette for every yellow. So you can match up all of your yellows and all of your reds uh, really nicely. Um, so that was really nice. Uh, there's also in the content for uh, or the curriculum, we had to use Scrimba to learn a lot of the React stuff. And I just kind of dug around a little bit on Scrimba and they had an entire course on Tailwind for free. And it was only a couple hours. So at the very end, when I was trying to style everything, uh, it was nice that I could be, oh, sweet. We could take a little Tailwind course nice and quick and, you know, make it a little bit fancier than we otherwise would have. Um, and it was kind of just the best thing to make all of the elements sort of match, if that makes any sense. But I definitely encourage you to check it out. Um, and I forgot what the second question was. <laughs> um, what was the date technology? Oh, date functions. It's uh, I think it's date functions. It's if you Google it, it's date dash FNS. Um, and it's just a, uh, an extra uh, package that you can add on NPM install. Um, uh, and it basically takes date inputs and uh, like translates them really easily in different formats the way that you want them. Um, and I kind of had to dig into the documentation a little bit for that, but once I figured it out, it was like, oh, I can, I can display whatever I want. Um, and it's kind of cool, like if you set up a profile on there and you type in your birthday, it shows you what day you were born on. Uh, and I made mine and apparently I was born on a Saturday, which is kind of cool. But um, yeah, that was, that's an, an easy one to kind of just throw in there, uh, add a little extra functions to kind of like make it work. Um, but then you can really do whatever you want with data inputs. Super cool. Um, got one more for you. Um, someone wants to know, will your app give recommendations based on past trips or interests in the future? Sorry if I missed that. <laughs> I mean, that's a great idea. I'm definitely going to add it to my list. I hadn't thought about that, but fantastic. <laughs> Looks like this, this person gave you more work to do. <laughs> I, I love it. Bring it on. I'm here for it. Awesome. Nice job again, John. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we got our, our last presentation for this evening. I'm going to invite Drew Holcomb up to present his data science project, Identifying Shakespearean Authorship. Awesome, thank you. Let me pull this up right quick. All right, are we seeing my screen all right? Yes, sir. Fantastic, thank you. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here today and uh, talk to you all about my modeling process in exploring the authorship of the works of William Shakespeare. Uh, to paraphrase the bard himself, some plays are written by Shakespeare, some are revised by Shakespeare, and others just have Shakespeare thrust upon them. So let's take a look. Uh, my name is Drew Holcomb, and I'm a data scientist with a background as a theater actor, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. All right. Just a brief overview of what we're going to be doing today. Today, we are going to be starting with getting an understanding of the question of authorship and of the data that I used. Uh, then we'll move into my modeling process, my results and my conclusions, and finally my limitations and some next steps I'm looking into. All right, for some background on the question itself, uh, plays written during Shakespeare's time were rarely documented very clearly. Uh, it was very common for writers to collaborate or revise others' works. It really looked a lot more like film writing looks today than it looks to write plays or books today. Um, and these collaborations weren't always really credited or documented. Uh, for instance, Shakespeare is known to have written works with John Fletcher, with Thomas Middleton, and with George Wilkins, both in some instances that were documented at the time and some that were not. Uh, one play that is credited to Shakespeare that has been speculated but not proven to have been a collaboration is called Timon of Athens. And if you haven't heard of it, it's not a good play. Uh, many aspects of this play are really unusual for Shakespeare. Its writing style changes throughout the play. Its tone is unusually cynical, and its conclusion is considered unsatisfying, which are not characteristic qualities of Shakespeare's writing. So the goal of my process is to go through Time of Athens line by line and identify sections that don't match Shakespeare's writing style, use this natural language processing, which is looking at word choice. And this will help, hopefully, historians and literary scholars identify sections of the text that might be worth some more detailed investigation. 
The data I used to train my model was a set of nine plays, four by Shakespeare and five by the most commonly proposed collaborator of Time of the Athens, which is Thomas Middleton. And I use these plays because these were all written around the same time as Time of Athens to account for both of these writers' styles evolving over the course of their careers. And the authorship of these plays is not commonly disputed. Uh, and my model looked only at dialogue rather than at state directions and character names and the like. All right, so jumping forward, my model that I, uh, my final model is a multinomial naive based model. And the reason that we use this type is that it had A, the highest accuracy score that I achieved. And also this could predict the probability that a given line was written by Shakespeare or Middleton rather than just sorting it into one of the two. So it gave us kind of a lot of middle gradation that we could look into. For the metrics you see on the left here, Shakespeare is considered the positive class in this case. So my model has an accuracy of 78.6%. It has a precision score of 78.1% and a recall score of 90.7%. If you don't know what those words mean, don't worry. This indicates, in essence, that my model is a lot more likely to mistake a line that was written by Middleton as being written by Shakespeare than the reverse. So we can just keep that in mind when we're interpreting the predictions that we're going to be looking at here from the model. So let's take a look here. This is King Lear, and this is to introduce the types of graphs that we'll be looking at over the next few slides. So this is my model's predictions on King Lear, one of the plays in our uh, training set, which was written by Shakespeare. This graph shows my model's predicted likelihood that each line of the play was written by Shakespeare, with that likelihood shown on our y-axis here. Um, and there will always be a horizontal line at 50%, which you can see here at the bottom of this graph. So here we see that King Lear's likelihood of being written by Shakespeare stays above at least 65% throughout the play. We don't see any strong characteristic changes throughout it. Um, it's, even, it's easily identified as being written by Shakespeare. We don't really see any evidence of co-authorship here. And now to show uh, the types of mistakes my model tends to make. Um, this is the same type of graph for the Phoenix, which was written by Middleton. So here we see that it mostly stays below 50%. So it's generally correctly predicted as being written by Middleton. However, here we see uh, some of these mistakes where it goes above 50%. So the model is predicting that these sections were written by Shakespeare, even with this play being written by Middleton and being part of our training set. So this is something that we can keep in mind when we're looking at time of Athens. It's not picking up on characteristic words of Middleton's in the way it's picking up on characteristic words of Shakespeare's. So moving on to our graph for Timon of Athens. So right away, we can see that Timon of Athens almost always stays above that 50% line. So it's being generally predicted as written by Shakespeare throughout the play. But what's interesting in this one, it's something that we don't really see in the other plays is that we have this middle section here between about lines 900 and 1400. And that section really comes a lot closer to Middleton's word choice than the rest of the play does. We also have a little dip here later in the play. But this one in the middle is really uncharacteristic. We don't see that in the other plays that the model was trained on. So especially given the mistakes that the model tends to make, where it's predicting Middleton is written by Shakespeare, that's a section that's worth some further investigation. So overall, from this modeling process, we see a really strong difference in the word choice in that middle section, like 900 through 1400 of Time and of Athens, which points to the possibility that Middleton either wrote that section or contributed to it in some way. However, at this point, the model doesn't firmly predict that Middleton wrote that portion or any other portion of the play. Some next steps I'd like to take to help clarify some of those findings include training on some additional Middletonian plays to helpfully pick up on some more characteristic words of his. Those include A Mad World, My Masters, and Michael Miss Term, both of which uh, I was not able to obtain in a usable format for this process. I'd also look into some other proposed collaborators, such as George Chapman, and investigate if those have any uh, merit to them. And I'd also be interested in applying this same process to other works with contested authorship, um, to provide suggestions as to where historians and literary scholars can investigate more closely. All right, and feel free to contact with me uh, with any questions you might have. I'll drop all of this in the chat so we don't have to scramble to write it down. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you all so much for your time. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Drew. Uh, I don't know about anyone else here, but I'm having some wild flashbacks to high school uh, language, uh, language arts and, and English class. Um, thanks for that <laughs> trip down memory lane. Um, cool. If anyone has questions for Drew, please throw them over into the the Q and A. Um, I would love to know, Drew. You know, kind of knowing what you know now about 
building a project like this and, and tackling all this data. Um, how how would you approach either your your next project, knowing what you know now, or maybe like if you could go back and, and start this from scratch? How would you mm. what would you do differently? Well, let's see. It's a very good question. Let's see. What would I do differently or what would I do on the same process? Interesting. I would. I think now I know in a way that I didn't know when I first started that uh, that the multinomial naive Bayes model is going to be the most time efficient way. When I was working through models, I was looking at random forests, I was looking at um, sport vector machines, was looking at some other methods. Uh, but what I found very quickly is that those take a very long time to run. And in a lot of cases, they're not much better than the multinomial naive Bayes model. So I think I would cut straight to the chase and know that that was going to be um, my best option. I think that's the first thing. And then um, something I learned throughout the process is I learned a lot about working with stemming and lemmatizations. Um, sorry for use technical language. Um, but a lot of those steps of the process, I now just am more familiar with. So I think I could cut a lot of the steps of experimenting around with some things that um, that I needed to really solidify my knowledge of when I was working on on this project. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for, thanks for answering that. That sounds really cool. Um, Great. So that is a wrap, everyone, for our final project showcase. Um, these happen monthly. So if you are maybe still uh, considering doing a boot camp, uh, exploring software engineering, data science, we also have product design and cybersecurity, um, feel free to kind of check out our, our website and our event bright page for our February uh, showcase to check out more projects. Um, I would love if our presenters could drop their contact info into the chat just one more time. We've been getting a lot of action over there, so the, the contact info tends to disappear quickly, and I'll give um, our attendees a moment to take down any info that they want to take down. Um, I am also going to share two links that, that I want uh, folks to have handy. Again, if you are uh, curious about learning more about Flatiron School, or you want to check out any past events that you may have missed, I will be leaving um, links for you in the chat to schedule a call with someone from our admissions team if you wanna learn more, or if you just wanna head to our YouTube page and subscribe and check out um, all of the great content we have there, I encourage you all to do so. Let's give it up one more time for our presenters. Thank you all so much for the hard work uh, you put into that. Those presentations were so awesome. Um, and that is a wrap for this evening. Thank you everyone for coming and we hope to see you at another event soon. Take it easy all.